Welcome. Thank you. Please have a seat. So, cybersecurity and open source software. Where do we begin? <laughs> um, you know, the, the question I get all the time is sort of, what, what is the state of open source security? Which is such a vague question. And it ranges from, you know, people who really don't know much about technology to say, it's open source stuff, should we just stop using it? Uh, to folks who say, well, it's too late on that one, and now we have to go look at how uh, open source affects all of our collective security. What, what are your, your thoughts on you know, sort of where, I know this is a broad question, um, but where from your perspective is sort of the state of security in open source software, um, and you know, what do you think are some of the things that are good, what do you think things, some of the things that can do better? Well, once upon a time, there was a lot of concern around security and open source products because, of course, the source code is available, and there was this, this, this worry that if the source code is available, then the attackers will be able to find the security vulnerabilities, right. which is kind of hilarious because they can certainly find vulnerabilities in closed source software as well. And then there was this idea, like Linus famously saying, uh, many eyes make all bugs shallow. And so the pendulum swung the other way. The problem is it really matters whose eyes are looking. And for a lot of open source projects, if they're really high visibility, if they're um, really high impact, then there might be folks out there looking. But for smaller projects that we might depend on in ways that are not as obvious, there may or may not be folks looking. And if there are folks looking, are they the right folks? And if they're the right folks with the right skill set, are they also willing to uh, engage with the community and share what they found and work to make those uh, projects more secure, they might actually be leveraging those vulnerabilities for their own nefarious purposes. Right. So th there's a lot of, um, it really matters who's, who, who's looking. Right. So we get to this point where we're very often working with very high impact projects, maybe with a small team. Maybe they don't have any security folks on board and uh, if they do, they might be volunteers, they're working on the things that are interesting to them and not necessarily the, some of the drudgery of, of application security because that's not the fun part and they're volunteers so their time is self-directed. And we end up in a situation where we have a lot of technology that we depend on and without necessarily a structured, comprehensive security program to support it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I want to come back to that, but I, a question that we always ask ourselves, both at the Linux Foundation and then I know in a lot of communities, is how, do, how does our project, how does our world be the best upstream community, security included, for a downstream user who's going to either use it directly or productize it and then sell some commercial service or solution? And, and the question I have for you, because you have lived in this world of application security, you know, sort of taking open source code, building it into a product or service, can you tell some of these folks how you see the world? How does that work for someone who's on the line for application service security when you're using open source? I'm not sure I understand the question. How do you view when you're working at Fastly, open source code that you're incorporating in your products and services? Like, do you check security? Would you have a process for it? Like, what is, how does application security work in that context for a commercial uh, company? Absolutely. So if we're incorporating open source software in any kind of environment, I always consider it the same way I do any third party code, that it may or may not be up to the security requirements for this project in our environment or for our deployment. And we have to evaluate it against our requirements. So there are, there's plenty of commercial software, closed source or whatever, that, that doesn't have a security program to address the kinds of issues that might be relevant for my environment. So whether it's coming from open source or a commercial third party, I have to evaluate it against the requirements for the situation that I'm working on. Um, and we may or may not have to do more work. On, and then the benefit, of course, is that if it's open source and there's community support, we can give that work back to them. Right. Um, which, you know, for a commercial provider, they may or may not uh, incorporate that work. Right. 
very similarly, but uh, I, I definitely treat it as uh, any third party library, any third party uh, consideration that I don't know if this was built to our standards, so I have to mitigate risk this way. It might be through isolation, it might be um, by, by doing our own analysis on it, uh, but I definitely treat it the same way I would any other right. third party code. Right. What advice would you give, though, to, you know, ecosystems, you know, where the Ruby or Node, where, you know, how, how do, it, it, does it create more work in terms of all these dependencies that come in and you, you don't maybe know where it's coming from or not? Is that, is that a big problem from your perspective or this is just all part of the same process? It's the same problem no matter where, where your code comes from. Yeah. It, it would be nice to think that, oh, well, this uh, provider, whether it's an open source team or it's a, a commercial provider, they've got their requirements set here. I ask a few questions about their, their development process and then I can say, oh, okay, it sounds like they're doing the kind of work that we need to do in our environment and we can just assume that this code is up to the, the standards for our environment. Uh, but I very rarely get to the point where I, where, where I feel like um, I can outsource that problem and say, like, they've got it handled right. and, and to our standards. Right. So it's... Um, it's very rare that you can say, this, is, this doesn't require investigation on our part. Yep. But what's more likely is that we find ways to isolate code. That's third, you know, that's, if, we, if you don't know what level of investigation has happened, and especially even with open source code, you can say, oh, we can do the analysis on it, but very often you're looking at you know, thousands or millions of lines of code, depending on, on what we're, we're looking at. Um, and to be able to do that kind of work in most development environments is really impractical especially if the, your engineering team is nowhere near as large as uh, a team would be to, to develop uh, software at that scale. Yeah. So you have to deploy other strategies like isolation and compartmentalization. Can I uh, put it on some other server? Can I uh, create a, a very small communications channel that has very little opportunity for, um, uh, for, for access from, from, from vulnerable areas? Can I reduce the, uh, the attack surface as much as possible? Right, yeah. I mean, I tell you, you're, you're, I, I talk to security professionals like you all the time, and just I can't imagine how difficult the job is given, you know, uh, Linus was on stage a, a year ago and we were talking about cybersecurity, and he said, you know, one of the hard things about someone who's writing code is it's very hard to think like a hacker, to, to think of like their attack vectors, and you know, what, what do you see are tactics that hackers are using now? Maybe they didn't before, or is there, you know, what are, what are you seeing out there? Get, get us a little bit into the mind of, of hackers. Things have really changed, There's, and it really depends on what, they're, what kind of hacker we're talking about. Uh, when I was a teenager and, and, and working on this stuff, the, <laughs> the, uh, the goal was probably getting access to something you otherwise wouldn't have access to, whether that was an operating system or um, you know, a, um, a site with, with a lot of bandwidth. That, those were the objectives. Right? Right. And then attackers started looking for you know, ways to compromise. Uh, oh, they want to host, they wanna host um, uh, copyrighted material, or they want to um, uh, put together a botnet to go um, spam folks. The, the objectives have completely changed. Now in, instead of um, you know, just grabbing the credentials or personal information off a machine and trying to monetize that, they're also leveraging your CPU time for uh, you know, mining Bitcoin. They're, the, the landscape's completely different, right? So now we're also talking about more sophisticated hackers. This is not like, um, these are you know, nation states instead. And so instead of let's say compromising machine we're, um, and, and, and taking what is present there, we're creating fake news and changing uh, election outcomes and um, the, the stakes are, are so much higher yeah. and the objectives are, are so much more sophisticated. Yeah. So we don't know what we don't know right. and tr trying to, uh, let's say, build an environment that mitigates risk that are so diverse and so um, it's hard for us to say what's going to be important for the future, but we're building the software that has to be resilient against tomorrow's threats today. Right. That's an incredibly difficult problem. Yeah. You know, we were talking backstage about our core infrastructure initiative where we, we are sort of all collectively dependent on this open source world out there. I think it's safe to say that 
there's so much dependency on open source that that's not going to change anytime soon. This is, you can't just rip all this stuff out and replace it. But you know, we spent a lot of time at the Core Infrastructure Initiative finding the intersection between you know, widely deployed and critical to society and kind of screwed up, right? And there, there, there were some obvious ones, you know, OpenSSL, I think is the best example with Heartbleed, and we spent a bunch of resources helping that team, and I, I think things got better. Uh, NTPD, another example, spent some resources there, unclear that that's better. What, what are some thoughts that you have on how we can in, improve the overall state of application security integrated into a development process? I realize this is like a, a humongous, <laughs> ambitious goal, but what, you know, share some thoughts that you have on, on how we might approach that kind of problem. Well, there are a couple of things. I think over time, developer awareness has really improved, that more folks who don't necessarily consider security to be their, their primary job still are familiar with the kinds of code constructs that could result in vulnerability and how to avoid them, and when they do peer review, on, on potential commits, they're looking for these kinds of things, and that's, that's a good start. I think one of the most important things to improve security has been the languages that have abstracted away from develop developers, things like memory management or crypto. We definitely want to be in an environment where fewer people are, are, are implementing those things. Um, because it's, it's fraught with peril. Those are operations that are, are difficult to do securely. There's lots of ways to mess it up. So if you're able to write your code in a, in a higher level language where memory management's not an issue, then you're potentially reducing your risk for memory corruption issues uh, down to just what the, what the platform exposes, which is, that's, that's a huge uh, burden that's removed. So now we're not going through that code looking for potential memory corruption vulnerabilities, we're, we're looking for logic issues, we're looking for uh, safe storage of secrets, that sort of thing. If you end up rolling your own crypto, you are creating all kinds of opportunities for problems. Whereas if you le leverage from the platform uh, the cryptographic libraries, and, and then on top of that you apply best practices, now you've really reduced your risk pretty significantly. So this move to higher level languages has done more to improve application security than, you know, any developer training we could do, any work that we could do as uh, a, a community of security researchers going out there and trying to review this code or do penetration testing or develop fuzz testing tools or, or any of the low-level analysis that we could do, which is so expensive in terms of time right. and really requires a, a skill set that's um, not so widely available and all those folks have full-time jobs. It's, it's just, um, yeah, I think moving, moving applications to higher level languages is possibly the best thing we can do for application security. Interesting, you know, I never thought of that. The, the, um, but you still have to, whether it's the Linux kernel or other things, make sure that test good test coverage, better coding practices. We had a, a kernel uh, security workshop here on Monday, and you know, you, you, I, I, the folks who attended that are just amazing folks. And it's this job, maybe potentially akin to yours as well, where you know the bathrooms never clean enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's this story about how uh, Bill Gates wrote this letter to uh, all of Microsoft back in, I think it was maybe 2003, saying, like, we're going to stop all development. We're no longer going to release any products. Everyone's going to take secure coding classes. We're going to do better threat modeling. We're going to, you know, go through this entire uh, effort to improve the security. Uh, I, I think they went and read every line of code. Uh, uh, the, the rumor is, has it that or you're fired, is what he's, basically what he's implying, but I'm sure that's what it was. You can't fire anybody in an open source project. But what do you think are some ways we could provide incentives for folks to learn about secure coding practices, or could we go crowdsource ways to improve test coverage? Or what are your thoughts on how we might do better at that? I think it's really hard when we're, we're talking about folks who are working on software or working on projects because they want to. They've got their own idea of, of how they want to spend their time, and maybe they don't think that the time that they spend working on security is going to be as important or valuable as the time they spend implementing new features. And by the way, this compromise is happening in every development environment, right? right? Security is one of those Give things that you don't get to feature. see until it fails, right. right? Whereas that new feature, that's something your users can feel today. And um, you know, capitalizing on this opportunity means that you know, more people will use your code, and that's very exciting. 
and it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to say that the time you spend in security is going to uh, have a, a measurable output because you don't have, have a problem until someone points it out to you necessarily. So you might actually be uh, in, in incredibly vulnerable. People might be taking advantage of the vulnerabilities in your code to, uh, to, to compromise the environments that it's running in, and you won't necessarily know that this is happening. So creating, I think, a bar beneath which no one should fall is, is probably the, 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 the best thing we can do as a community to say that this is a critical skill for CS students, that it's part of all curriculum, that it's part of the, it's part of a development environment that you, that you do this work, that we do threat modeling, that we do identify security requirements for this code, that we discuss what the code is intended to mitigate and what it's not, so that when you're making decisions about how to use it in your environment, you can say, well, I'm gonna to have to mitigate this problem some other way because they're saying they're not resilient against these kinds of problems. Good, that's actually really helpful. Yeah. Saying that, um, uh, you know, exposing the, 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 the tools you're using for analysis to um, define vulnerability, because other folks might be able to build on that and, and, and change, for example, let's say this is, this is our, our suite of fuzz testers that we're using against this, this code base. Other folks can start from somewhere, they don't have to start from scratch and then build upon that. And, uh, and we can leverage the, uh, the, the work that, they're, that, that already exists in this, in this environment. Because there might be somebody who wants to, to participate for a little while, but they don't necessarily have you know, six months to invest, or they're, you know, they're, they've got a full-time something else that they're doing, but they're, they're interested in this project because of something that catches their attention for a yeah. little while, make it a little bit easier to, to contribute um, more lightly. Yeah. But I think raising, raising our standards for what constitutes a, a professional development environment um, and, uh, and what constitutes a professional software developer in terms of, 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 of creating those, those, those baseline security practices and, and skills. Yeah, you know, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is figuring out what is the most critical shared software in the world. Who, what are the software packages, version number, dependencies that everybody's using that poses this systemic risk? And then, you know, I think, you know, you nail it, which is you know, what is that lowest bar and for lack of the command and control in open source, one of the things we always talk about is how do you create this culture of secure coding practice or application security in open source? And, you know, you, you spend your career and your day probably convincing executives and other people that, you know, the balance between the new feature and those practices. Can you give us advice on how you, how do you sell that? How do you sell the investment in uh, that minimum bar or, or, or you're even higher? And any advice that you can give us? And I realize it's a hard question. <laughs> I think among developers, we want to have pride in the work that we do. And if we consider these, if we consider this work to be a, a, a default requirement, then not doing it means that you, you're kind of running a sloppy organization. And I think maybe shame has a little role to play here, where, and pride, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're two sides of the same coin. You, you want to have pride that you're, you're operating a, um, a development environment that's, that's, that's doing reasonable things. Like if you put in a change and it, it, it has a 20% performance impact, you feel like that's unacceptable, right? right. If you uh, do, some code anal do some analysis on your code and you identify all these different constructs that could result in vulnerability and you just leave them there, right? That should feel, that should feel uncomfortable, like, oh, I'm not taking care of, of the basics. So I think raising our standards as a, as a community, saying that this is what a, de a professional development environment looks like, this is what a solid development team looks like, this is what a good developer looks like, and incorporating security into all those different aspects. I think that's one of the ways that we're going to, across an entire industry, raise the bar. Yeah, you know, one of the things I always uh, struggle with is, you know, fear also sells, right? In terms of like, hey, you, 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 we all have to do this together because all of society's privacy is at risk if there is vulnerability systemically in cryptography, for example, or other things. And it's this balance of, you know, simplifying the narrative too much of like, hey, if you don't do this, the world's going to end, to the more nuanced and real argument of, you know, hey, this is, a, this is a journey, there's a set of processes you need to employ, there's a minimum bar, there's, you know, sort of shame versus incentives. And how do you think think we can explain those to folks who may not know 
about application security in, 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 a, in a way they can understand it? I mean, what, what do you do when you talk to execs at Intel or folks outside of Intel about these complex issues? I try not to operate with fear as my first uh, okay. uh, yeah. step because people get fatigued from folks coming in and saying the sky is falling. Right. Because the sky is always falling. And yes, there's always vulnerability in everything. And whether or not that sky vulnerability... The sky is always falling. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Though. In it's insecurity, this is just... It's, it's, it's always a disaster. Like, this vulnerability can compromise everything. And so can that vulnerability. And all those ones as well. And over here is another bucket of, of vulnerabilities that can also compromise everything. And at some point, you're just kind of like, well, if everything is so insecure, then why, why do anything? What can we possibly do? Right? Yeah. And it gives you an excuse to say that, well, it's not worth doing anything. Right. As opposed to, you know, we're going to set the bar here and knock this stuff out. And that's attainable. And we can say, OK, there's going to be problems, but the bar is higher. And the set of folks who can take advantage of those kinds of problems, they have to make an investment that looks like this. And that's tolerable for now. Now let's raise the bar. You know, again, and it's an iterative process. We can say, OK, we have confidence that we've addressed most of the stuff that's down here, or at least the stuff that we're able to identify. And the bar is higher, and the investment is higher. So if an attacker wants to find a vulnerability here, they have to spend this kind of time to do it. But then to exploit a vulnerability that's here, they also have to uh, build, build an ex exploit that circumvents all these different mitigations that we've put in place. And that's expensive. And then if they try to exploit it in the wild, in deployment, folks have got all these different ways of identifying that there's potentially an exploit in progress. And so if it's identified, then that specific problem is going to be, or that specific exploit is going to be difficult to use over and over again. Because once we know about it, as an industry, we can mitigate it in that software. We can create ways to identify that it's happening. And so that becomes less effective. We can't use it over and over again. Yeah. And that bar is even higher. So now, in addition to a vulnerability and an exploit, we've got maybe this is how they got around this mitigation. And now we can make the mitigation stronger. We can make the software more resilient. We can make the environment more able to identify these kinds of attacks. And over time, the bar gets higher and higher. And that's actually what's happened. It is actually a lot harder now to compromise an environment or even uh, an operating system or, or a device because you need multiple vulnerabilities. You need a vulnerability in every layer. So this is the core defense in depth right. that is part of the, the SDL that we want to make sure that we've got, that we're not relying on any single technology, that even once it's compromised, it's not fully compromised. You don't keep all your eggs in one basket. You don't keep all of your money with you at the same time. You're not walking around like literally carrying all of your wealth at any point in time. You've got um, you know, what you need. You're isolated other stuff. You've, you've, you've created an environment where it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to easily get to any specific asset that's high value to you and, and, and potentially a great target for somebody else. Yeah. So all those mechanisms together allow us to create an environment where the attacker has to work harder and harder and harder and harder. And they're willing to do that for a very high value asset, but not, yeah. not for it, everything. It, they can't. It takes a nation state, not some random person who gets a hold of a tool. It, it just, it, that, that bar getting higher certainly makes us all, all, yeah. all safer. It, it's, it's interesting because I would love to have more conversations between folks like who, you who see, see sort of this broad view of the world and how technology is, is implemented, and then you know, open source projects that are working kind of to some degree in isolation. I mean, I think these do understand how their software gets implemented, but not day in, day out, right? They're working on, on the code. And so speaking of, of, of end users and people who are implementing this software, because uh, we have a bunch of them out here, what advice would you give to folks who every day are getting sold, well, if you use this uh, software composition analysis tool, or you do a bug bounty program, or you do this particular tool, or I've got this thing to sell you, it just, I get questions all the time from folks saying, like, this just is confusing to me. And, you know, how do I deal with all that? What, what advice do you have to those folks who are, are, are implementing these systems and getting sold a lot of different tools and things out there? It's definitely easy to get overwhelmed. And it's really hard <coughs> to identify whether this, this thing that someone's trying to t sell you is going to be useful in your environment. So I, I turn to metrics. I try to say, OK, I evaluated this source code analysis tool. I ran it on my project. And I got this many red flags. And after, after I investigated um, the red flags, I ended up with this many actual issues that required a fix in code. And the time I spent to get those issues identified and resolved looked like this. 
if I have a tool that's giving me thousands of flags to like one or two real issues, then that's a lot of time I'm spending trying to make that tool useful in my environment. Even though that, that tool might be highly recommended and that salesperson was so convincing, their, 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 uh, their pamphlets were so glossy, this might not be where I want to invest my, my, my time, which is actually much more interesting than where you invest your money from a security perspective. So what things do have a good, a good return? So for example, um, this code that we're implementing does a lot of, process, a, a lot of um, parsing, right? That might be a lot of attack surface and it's exposed through this interface. And is there some way that we can isolate that? I would look for mechanisms that we can use to reduce attack surface. And one of the most inexpensive tools broadly available on every platform that you can use that makes your code more secure immediately is delete. You can cut out code that doesn't solve a purpose that you need to support any longer and reduce your attack surface dramatically by just not having it present. And it's reasonable to say that, oh, someday somebody might want to use this. And it's really hard to, 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 to say, well, we don't need this anymore and so we're going to get rid of it. But that is actually making your code significantly more secure because the pathways that are widely in use are the ones who are going to be, that are going to be most um, widely investigated or inspected. And then it's the edge cases that they don't get as much inspection, they're like less maintained, we haven't looked at it in, in quite a while. Those are the places that are, are going to bite you. So if it's not necessary, or if you can modularize it, like, hey, most folks are going to use this set of, of, of features. And for folks who need this functionality, maybe we could implement it in a modular way and, and isolate it so that most folks aren't exposed to this. And the, the bulk of your users, or folks who end up deploying your software, uh, get the code that is able to be inspected at the, the closest level of detail. I, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I could talk about this all day, but I, I do want to ask you one thing. I, I would love you to come back and continue this conversation. I think this is such an important thing for folks to hear in our communities. Let's determine what that bar is. Uh, and just the way you look at the world, I think, is so helpful to folks who are writing code or implementing it. Uh, who, you know, we just uh, did a multi-million dollar security audit, and if we had just had a little bit of discipline and hit that delete key, we could have saved all that money. <laughs> so uh, getting your perspective is, is always good. So I, we would love to have uh, you back, and thank you so much for your advice and for coming here today. Thank you. All right.